that fiend Thompson came to Portland last night, traded drugs on stage with innocent children, bragged about beating them to death. I don't even fish, you know. Told the president, filthy gerbil, and, and offered no solutions to the, the broken and crippled sad young chaps who uh, brought their families to uh, hear his you know, last uh, pieces of advice before the Armageddon. I ain't Hunter, it's true, but the man is here. I don't know what I could say to, uh, to tell you what you do. The phone, is, the phone has been ringing literally off the hook for five days, and there's so many people disappointed that they're not here tonight. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful evening. He's a great gentleman. Uh, it's funny, his agent paint, has been painting him as this, uh, this horror show, uh, this uh, t t twisted human being. Uh, and it's part of his rap, you know, he gets an extra 500 bucks from me because he says... Hunter Thompson, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Seattle. So was I. <laughs> yeah. You must have an earlier train. And you didn't break down in despair and personal uh, grief and uh, maggotry as I did. I had a, uh, a problem with a wino in Seattle. A member of my family. And can you hear me now? Back in the back? No? Well, no. I didn't come here to lecture you people on sound. I am not a sound engineer. I'm good, I'm good at it. I have 80 speakers in my living room, but I don't pretend to be a sound engineer. What was your mother like? What was my mother like? <laughs> you should ask what she is like. She's a wild, heavy, elegant old bitch. <laughs> yeah, really a good, uh, a hard rocker. And she's a, like a third generation Kentuckian. Now, I don't know, there are, there are probably such a thing as third generation Oregonians. Right? Lewis and Clark? Yeah? Too much inbreeding. <laughs> inbreeding? <laughs> you people have uh, not done well here, have you? <laughs> no, this is one of my favorite uh, towns. And so what? I, all right, well, it's true, goddammit. I'm not. I don't get mushy very often, and you will pay for that one, whoever that was. <laughs> I will not get mushy again. You screwed up your face, sir. You're giving me lips. You're making lips at me, I see. I, I can tell by the, the cut of your shirt, sir, that you're probably one of those people. Come right in, come right in. Perhaps you have a paragraph or two. Well, you know, the whiskey was no ice. On some days, you just want to beat the living shit out of somebody. And then that the cops came and cleaned them up. The little rats. Uh, they were locking yeah. them through the fence. <laughs> yeah, man, you can't get out there. Yeah, so how far does this fence go, you know? Well, of course we can get out. And I uh, started okay. looking down inside it, and he's uh, all the way down in the lake. Uh, I thought he was in the swine. What happened to you one of these days? I had the, uh, the pistol. What is that? We carried this at all times. And we had, I guess they loaded. Well, I guess they loaded up and uh, when the, finally when the police came, I had to go and fire it. You know, like a satchel on the way back. I figured that these little bastards, people screwed in the afternoon of the golf course at night. Lumber thieves, and plywood thieves. You know, one of these things in the stomach would turn a person around. 
What are you going to do? I was behind the fence. No, I understand. I couldn't call any. Uh, any I, I, uh, I mentioned all the cab. We've got to. Uh, We're trying to get seriously busy here. Okay. You've been calling me every conceivable kind of name, you dirty sock. You dirty, stupid bastard. I found a hole in the fence. You flaming asshole. Yeah, well. Well, we were, uh, we're an hour away from uh, perdition here. Well. Not to mention the first edition. I don't, uh. I guess, I guess uh. I'm, we're gonna do it. Well, fuck this. We'll probably do better without, uh. What is this, anyway? Uh, that was just one of my notes that I just threw out there. I should get to the typewriter. There. There it is. Yeah. Well, that was hoping that uh, Mr. Kent Seal is a deep fucker, but I tested it when I was getting something. Come on, Kent. Come on. Now, I was never in that business. Never in the business of managing the uh, national economy, and neither was Ronald Reagan. And what the horror of it is that neither was anybody else. Those people from Wall Street don't care about the national economy. They care about, here comes Donald Don Regan from uh, Merrill Lynch. And what do you think he cares about? Uh, the economy in Texas? The price of cotton? No, he cares about what's happening with Merrill Lynch. And he's made uh, chief of staff. He, what do you made chief of staff? He and Baker had lunch one day and said, let's trade jobs. Yeah, so, so Jim Baker, who is the smartest uh, politician functioning in Washington, maybe with his half-bastard brother Howard, uh, those, those two are, uh, are the best right now. Baker said, okay, I'll just leave this White House and I'll go to be uh, Secretary of the Treasury and you take over here. So uh, Reagan, who is into a deep drool once again, I, I feel sorry for the old man. I really have an affection for him. He shares a, a quality with me, which is a profound intellectual laziness. I suspect with some of you. Yeah, he was a radio sportscaster on the Mississippi River, somewhere out of Illinois. Yeah, Mark, he thought of himself as Mark Twain. But, uh... Mark Twain didn't try to be president. And you want to remember that uh, it isn't just an actor's job. You know, actors uh, don't really care about their roles. And they, they're gonna, they can, like Reagan, they can sell light bulbs, they can sell uh, anything. And they can sell uh, Star Wars, apparently. And Ronald Reagan has endorsed the uh, Book of Revelation as a sort of a sketchy guideline for the 80s. <laughs> I don't know. I really feel sorry for the man because he didn't understand what he's, what he's doing. He, they, told, they, they put him up there and they said, uh, handle this, Dutch. And, uh, here, now he's 76 years old. He almost got away with it. All of his life. He was uh, elected governor of California in 1966. And he handled that for two uh, terms. And they called him a genius. Meanwhile, he ran up a triple budget deficits in California and never paid any attention to anything. The first thing he did was strip the insane out of all the uh, uh, mental health facilities. Now we're here! <laughs> all right, all right, all right, Bill. No. <laughs> I bought this silk with shirt. I mean, uh, this shirt was silk with, excuse me, but it's Rayon and it's hot. Now, I shouldn't talk too much here. If you want lectures, you really uh, can go to listen to uh, Ronald Reagan, who's uh, very short-winded of late. <laughs> How many of you believed his, uh, his statement last week or his speech? How many of you were turned around? <laughs> well, when he, uh, ex when he explained himself on the uh, Terror Commission report. You didn't see it up here? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Really, I'd much rather argue than talk. To deal with the, the police. And then go through all this and never even ask for a license. Or, 
Cab driver came. And I gave him, uh, I called a cab for the time. And said, uh, hey, I'm stuck in this goddamn golf course by the gate. And when he came in, right behind him was a cop. And his kid came up to the big iron bar. He said, hey, man, don't worry. Uh, I have to little, little, uh, you know, handle everything for you. And just a minute, and I tricked the cab driver and said, no, 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 I'm seeing a typewriter. I had the damn uh, TV set from the bin mm -hmm. in the back seat in the, in the, in the Firebird. So you look in, I bet you, did. you know, the, you know, the, the oh, cab driver has right. my leather bag and the, like, four golf yeah. clubs. In the back here, there's you know, the stolen TV set in the back seat. Didn't mention. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's been everywhere, isn't he, that bastard? Hey, you talk about a guy who had fun. Everybody all over North has had about, a, had about as much fun as anybody has had for about five years in government. No one knows who was running the White House. It turns out that Oliver North was running the foreign policy. And Oliver North, for six years or so, had the run of the whole world. He could rent Switzerland. He could buy uh, fleets of uh, Danish boats. The government's not involved in Central America. Didn't you hear? <laughs> yeah. This is a bunch of uh, renegades who are prowling around naked in the uh, White House basement, fucking the secretaries. <laughs> and they got no money. Nobody has, uh, nobody's traced any money to the uh, countries yet. They said they got $100,000, but it came from somewhere else. Oliver North had... Uh, what, three days that Ed Meese gave him in order to clear out and shred all the files on this hideous criminal operation that Meese knew all about. Uh, Me there were four people who knew about it. It was Meese, Bush, Regan, and North. And Fawn Hall! <laughs> Probably so, yeah, Fawn Hall. Now, well, she was, uh, her, uh, that's why they gave her immunity. She didn't know all about it. So they given her immunity on the shredding. So when the whistle was blown on them, when uh, this uh, Syrian vapor in Iran blew the whistle on the uh, arms deal and the, uh, the rats went wild in Washington after that, Meese said to Oliver North, who had been a real champion, well, he was the, uh, the Dick Tracy, the hero, uh, he did everything of the, the administration. How he did that, I'll never know. So here's Ali North, who's now putting the fifth. Uh, in there with Vaughn with Hall for three days, trying to, to get rid of the documents. Now, have you seen the documents they got out of there? Ye gods, what came out of there was a monster file of horrible gibberish in here. What in the hell were they doing down there? Uh, uh, Ali North and Vaughn Hall, and probably that, that son of that Contra, uh, that uh, Cruz, or uh, what's his name, the little maniac who uh, was probably seen to marry Vaughn Hall, Here's a Contra leader in the White House situation room, down you know, in the NSC basement, with the secretary all the time, with Oliver North. And, and they, they shredded everything they could, and they tried to get the computer clean, and they couldn't do any of it. And George Bush had no fun. Oliver North had fun. What was Bush's role? George Bush's role, 
he, I would suspect, my feeling is he's the most guilty of all of them. No, we have a, a, a story here that's going to be worse than Watergate, much deeper. Why do I say my ass? You really, um, you really would cost you a Yeah. I'll get this little bastard. You know, it's, I can signal people and yeah. I'm going to bring them in. They didn't see the pistol. That might have caused me trouble. It's not illegal, but it's yeah, fancy. So much yeah. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. What? Well, then I had to get rid of it. You know, to fire it off. Oh, okay. Hey, man. Although you've never said that. You need change? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do we have any cigarettes? Why aren't you typing? Because I don't have any cigarettes. Oh. She and you. Oh, man, I tried, I tried. Oh. Now, here's the vice president. Yeah, he had two, he had, well, he had a staff aide uh, named Donald Gregg, who ran the uh, uh, aid to the, uh, the first phase of the aid to the Contras operation. And he had that uh, Max Gomez, uh, or a alias Max Gomez, uh, Rodriguez, uh, an, an old-time uh, Cuban, uh, anti-Castro Miami type and these people worked out of Bush's office and there's a an arms trial arms sale trial in New York that was cancelled about two months ago uh, with 17 really bad people on trial for selling arms to Iran for two billion dollars and the reason for it was that uh, George Bush they said had okayed the damn thing now that was two billion and now they're, they're looking now for 19.5 million which has clearly disappeared, gone, gone. Garbonafar, you know, ugly little bastard, bad temper. And, uh, you know, they're seizing uh, what, uh, Khashoggi's airplanes, his Salt Lake City uh, uh, shopping centers. But 20 million is nothing. These people were in for 2 billion, and it was dismissed because George Bush interfered, allegedly, in the uh, evidence procedure. And that I mean Farlane, uh, uh really a silly little fart, who uh that's true, I'm sorry I uh get that course about it. He used to work for John Tower as a staff assistant. A man who what ate thirty volumes and thought he would kill him. <laughs> oh. she had Jim Morrison ate thirty volumes for breakfast. Uh, it was a lame thing, but we have people who nobody here would drink with. You know, you wouldn't give them a ride in your car if they were hitchhikers and they, they, got, they got in and started saying, well, I, uh, you're like, what are you doing, man? Where are you going? Well, I went to Washington. I'm the national security advisor. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd, uh, I'm a mad man. I give them a ride for a while, but McFarlane and Poindexter were so dumb and so low and ugly and just cheap that uh, you'd put him out at the next uh, crossroads. Almost all politicians and all lawyers should be castrated so their genes should not be passed along. What about your genes? My genes? I've been selling them for a long time in a massive sperm bank. Yeah, out of Frankfurt, Kentucky. Yeah, the J.C. Penney family runs a sperm bank. Of, uh, that's true, out of Frankfurt. And I've been selling my sperm to them for about 13 years. And you ask me how I live and how I pay for my drugs and my whiskey? Well, that's how I do it. <laughs> Why can't I find... What do you need? Ashtray. Take that cup right here. You know what happens? That cup right there. Right you use that thing? Yeah. All right, right. Yeah, you get it. Yeah, you get it. Yeah, you get it. Yeah, you get it. No. Oh. Red tape. Tangle it up. What do you say? Tangle it up. This is what the place is doing. Tangle it up.
I don't want to be doing, well, repeating right. myself here. If you're getting some out of that, I don't want to be doubling up on that. More. Yeah, we'll get this to you in just a sec. All right. They were one of those holes up there on the fourth corner, 14 and 15? Yeah, um, 15, or, or yeah, 14 uh, on end. Where the ones we, where you got, we got caught in the dark? Yeah, yeah the right. ones we played in the dark were 16, 17, and 18. Okay, 15, 17, 18, and shot for $1,000 there. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I remember every lousy sticking shot. Oh, 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 I bet you do, man. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Crippled him. Crippled him. He came into a, 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 a team mm -hmm. in green in the darkness. Well, he had actually had a really good shot. I had, I had glass glass of mine. He was building over a tree. So. And he, was, he, he had the whole locked up with like a birdie. We, we sludged up in the green. I thought I lost my ball. Uh, and we came to the green in the darkness. There was a ball like 10 feet. Uh, and I got like, 180 yards, seven iron over the over a huge tree. I, I couldn't win. Okay, what about the next hole? The next hole? Where I hit the... After you drove it into the uh, into the bushes, right? No, the par three where uh, where uh, I I hit it to 20 feet. You hit a little squiver, 100 100 yards from the tee. Hit the second shot over the green. I make I go get down in two for a three. You're sitting over the green in two, 20 feet, and you hit a fucking seven iron chip that takes one bounce and hits the fucking flag stick and drops in like a stone. Death and the queer and the weird and the lame. Asshole. <laughs> what about Doonesbury? Uh, I never had much to do with coming strips. Uh. Well, it depends on your perspective, you know, it, uh... What is your perspective? Well, I can tell you that, uh, people who grew up in this country want to be, what, firemen and cowboys and pimps, maybe, you know, you never know. Or sheriff! But, or maybe sheriff, but nobody grows up here wanting to be a coming strip character, do they? <laughs> so I'm a pioneer. And no, I don't. Uh, I don't like it. Get a royalty? Hell no, that filthy little animal. <laughs> yeah, his parents sent him to Yale. They slaved and worked. They were humble people. And they sent this boy. They boy to Yale for four years. And all he learned to do was to steal other people's work. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a shock. But I don't, I don't pay much attention to it. I was in the middle of covering the Pulitzer divorce trial, which is really covering the uh, Palm Beach. Uh, now, I realize you live out here in this clean, uh, wet air, and uh, it isn't like Palm Beach. And you can't imagine how really corrupt those people are. And that's all I, all I did was explain that Palm Beach is like this. When nobody works, and everybody makes a million dollars a year just clipping coupons, and and they fight over uh, inches of beachfront on the you know sand, and well, remember that story where the uh, the freighter washed up in one of those women's yards? That's Palm Beach. Yeah. She was amused, amused. <laughs> Is that there? They had 81 Haitians washed up there one day, and they were amused. Yeah, dead Haitians, boat people. Yeah, there's nothing to, uh, Palm Beach is a funny place. Yeah, they got a sense of humor that won't quit. And I would never claim they were guilty. I would have to go over to Roxanne's house every night uh, when I had to be in court. Well, the press contingent was so huge and they had 12 press dates, so you had to be there at seven in the morning to sign up. No matter who you were, it didn't matter. So I would have to stay up every night at Roxanne's house, and those people would take cocaine in bags like the, the sort of thing you'd buy in a, uh, a drugstore with tal talcum powder, and just shake it out on the uh, kitchen table and, and say, well, we have to do it all now because we have to go to court in the morning. <laughs> uh, that was hard on me. 
and yeah, they were more excessive than I was. Uh, Nixon's a guy who uh, admits now that he did not burn the tapes, and that was his, uh, his main failure. You know, Nixon was evil. Nixon, you know, he maneuvered. Nixon got to his knees, on his knees at night in the Lincoln Room, and prayed to the portrait of uh, Abe Lincoln. And Nixon made weird deals, you know, with Kissinger at three in the morning. Nixon took Manolo, the butler, out at five in the morning, saying, uh, after he drunk three margaritas, which was, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, martinis, which was, when Richard Nixon drank three martinis, that was it. It was like uh, the rest of us eating a lot of acid. Uh, uh, Nixon could not drink. It was not a racial thing or a uh, stature. Uh, I always, I wondered about it, it was karmic. And Nixon could not go out with his speechwriters and drink with reporters. He could not, he could not mingle. So when he did, he would go utterly nuts at night. And of course his wife was a, uh, a, kind of a question mark, a pretzel of some kind. <laughs> and his family hated him and abhorred him. So he was left at night with Manolo, the butler. <laughs> and unlike Reagan, who goes, takes naps and goes to sleep, Nixon didn't. He would prowl the White House at night. And there was a... Uh, anti-war protests of some kind when Nixon grabbed Manolo and said, let's go out and talk to them. And he went and talked football to them, something about Ohio State. You know, like uh, 15,000 children underneath the uh, Washington Monument. Nixon had a sense of, let's go out and play. You know, well, not play, but he was a player. Now, Nixon's, he was evil, but he would hurt you. Yeah, just to get into the White House to talk to Nixon was, uh, will keep you real sharp for a long time. Nixon or North or Meese, it's the same old bullshit. Nothing's ever gonna change. Well, let me just tell you something, Sport, and I agree with you, and uh, I have done that and thought that way before, but let me warn you that uh, this time they are gonna fall apart, and someone's gonna have to pick them up. And this is democracy, and unless you're a, uh, a foreign national or an agent of a foreign power, and maybe even then, you may be the one to have to pick it up. No, that's the... Uh, yeah, we all pray for the uh, Armageddon and the uh, bonfires on the hill and the great shrieking and the, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, we want, we want the action. But we do live there, uh, and we're not going to die, not all of us, in this uh, Holocaust. And this is a dark thought, and I don't want to ruin your young life, but it's going to change. But nobody, I'm not going to take care of the change. Ed Meese is not going to take care of the change. You're going to be a part of that. Yeah. And it's true. The mentality behind the drug? What do you use? What kind of stuff do you use? I'll tell you what I use. I, uh, Oh, I could tell you anything at all, couldn't I? <laughs> but I'm in a, I'm in kind of a, you know, sort of a dead end, ugly mood tonight. I don't catch them, and I beat them to death. It's just my. Uh... <laughs> Arnold Roberts is going to die very soon, isn't he? <laughs> Al? Big Al. Al ran it for a while. Yeah. He made the mistake of admitting it one day. Yeah. I would kill them all. Well, hey, I, I don't know what God's going to do. I've always uh, kept a safe distance from him, but... Hey, wait a minute now. What have you been reading? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a ring of truth in what you're getting at, but uh, I don't think I've said these things. I don't want to go to my grave thinking that they all spoke a different language. Maybe the draft. Maybe the draft should be back, so you'd be really scared.
This, this is a case for the generation of the swine boys. This is a case for the 80s. participation where each person on the panel is going to just say a few comments, uh, general comments, either where at their seat or at the podium, whichever they're more comfortable with. It's a little crowded there. We want to try to bring the audience into a discussion of Vietnam and the 72 campaign. Uh, they're both interchangeable in many ways. So instead of doing large um, warm-ups or, or introductions here, I'll make them very brief. And um, I think what might be the best, um, Steve, do you want to come up? This is, or talk there, yeah, what, he's just going to make a few comments on his paper, and then we'll, um, just very briefly, then we'll start going through each panelist to make a couple of remarks. Uh, thanks a lot, Doug, and uh, it's certainly an honor for me to be uh, associated with this symposium, and in particular, this distinguished panel. Um, certainly, I've considered staying up here all day just to receive the glow from them, but I, I promise you I will be very brief. Um, <laughs> amid the aftermath of the 1968 uh, election, George McGovern chaired the Commission on Party Structure and Delegate Selection, a name the press simplified to the McGovern Commission. Ultimately, its members developed a series of guidelines designed to increase the number of presidential primaries and to make delegates to future conventions more responsive than in the past to rank and file Democrats. The commission also served as a catalyst for the birth of a new brand of politics within the party. The relatively successful efforts to reform the party not only vaulted the commission recommendations into party law, but also diluted the traditional influence of labor and local party bosses in favor of more progressive activist Democrats. You all know the, the story of the uh, 72 campaign, so I won't go over that, but suffice it to say that the, in general, the regard for the campaign has remained unchanged since 1972. As the New York Times put it, uh, McGovern ran a gallant campaign and showed his confidence in the rightness of his vision of America. But the editorial acknowledged that because of his politi political base being too narrow, the social outlook allegedly too radical, McGovern lost. Since then, uh, neoconservative analysts have um, come into the fray as well. And as uh, subsequent presidential elections have uh, seen the demise of a Democratic Party, uh, Ronald Radish offered the newest of, these, of this interpretation, and his title is, in fact, the book of is, of his is called Divided They Fell, The Demise of the Democratic Party. It focuses on the political effects of the reform movement, and he places the demise of the Democrats squarely on the shoulders of George McGovern and the Reform Commission he chaired. I quote from him, gearing the party to liberal constituency groups and activists rather than to traditional de a traditional Democratic electorate. McGovern opened up the party to a course that would, over the decades, result in a steady loss of electoral support. As you'll be all glad to know, my paper is a rejection of this interpretation. I was expecting applause. Very good. Erroneously, critics of the McGovern Commission depend upon the clarity of hindsight to distort the party's reaction to the events of 1968. By focusing on the Republican victories in the presidential elections of the 1970s and 80s and moving backward, Radish and other neoconservatives have neglected the context in which the Democrats formed their political strategies in the late 1960s and early 70s. Instead of viewing the McGovern Commission as a reasonable response 
to Nixon's victory in 68, critics dismiss it as ideological folly. They inferred that had the Democrats not reformed themselves, the party would have chosen a stronger candidate in 1972 and perhaps defeated Nixon. In turn, they conclude that the party would have stemmed the tide of conservatism that's, that surfaced in the 1980s. Radish's work suffers in particular from his attempt to defend this ne negative supposition. In his book, he not only ignored the strategy that the Democratic Party developed in the aftermath of the 68 uh, election, but he also overlooked evidence suggesting that the reform effort had rejuvenated the party by 1970. My paper examines the first two years of the McGovern Commission, 1969 and 1970. During this period, McGovern and other party leaders focused almost exclusively upon the results of the election of 1968 and followed a path that they believed would revitalize the Democratic Party. Those who served on the McGovern Commission and supported its work did so as a rational and well-intentioned well response to the election results. Indeed, the McGovern Commission soon became the most dynamic entity within the party. Eventually, the fervor of reform-oriented groups, the vast voting potential of a new generation of young voters, and the results of the midterm elections of 1970 convinced party leaders, including George McGovern, of the reform path's promise. In sum, McGovern and the Democrats chose to reform the party for the most compelling reason. A reformed party structure appeared to offer the best chance for future electoral success. Thank you very much. I should have mentioned Steve Ward's at American University, and he's working on a, his, a project on this, so he, I'm sorry you had to give him a truncated version of that, but it'll be one of the papers in the book. We have so many people here from 72 campaign, and we'll just start with Bob Shrum on that end, and then we'll go to, um, to Hunter Thompson. But let's begin with um, Bob Shrum, who I think we all know um, covered the campaign and, and, and is a leading journalist in America. Hey, do better than that. No, no, I mean, that 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 <laughs> That's Hunter. <laughs> Hunter covered some version of the campaign. Yeah, in, in, uh, some version of a guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's identifying. Uh, I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to to have Senator McGovern and John Holm and Frank Mankiewicz let me join the campaign as a speechwriter. It was one of the best experiences of my entire life. I believe the campaign made three singular contributions. First, Senator McGovern told the truth about two great issues, Vietnam and Watergate. I remember at one point in the fall, uh, we got some polling advice saying people weren't really buying this and we should talk maybe about some other things. And I remember his reaction is then, what am I running for? Uh, it was a rare example, I think, of what one ought to do in politics, which is actually stand for something one believes. Secondly, he became, and I think this is often forgotten, uh, a tribune of issues that were going to move to the center of future debate and change in America. I think first of tax reform and simplification, uh, which Time Magazine at the time, in the middle of the campaign, wrote a piece saying this will be an issue for the next generation. Secondly, of campaign reform and public integrity, when he said this is the most corrupt administration in American history, he got a lot of criticism. It was true. And he really advanced, I think, the whole cause of running different kinds of campaigns. And thirdly, at least for a lot of us in a time of disillusion and cynicism, he gave an example of integrity and grace. He wasn't desperate. He didn't run around looking for something he could say that would please people at the moment. And ultimately, he was driven by principle and not polls and gimmicks. I think there were three tragedies in the campaign. First, the nation never really saw Senator McGovern for the principled and sensible person he was. That was partly our fault because the acceptance speech was given at 3 a.m. in the morning. It wasn't his fault. He couldn't do anything about it at that point. I mean, we were trapped in a process that was very protracted. Secondly, I think 72, with the exception of Hunter and Bill Greider and a few other people, saw the rise of horse race reporting and the decline of substance coverage. I remember at one point the senator gave a very serious proposal on the environment, big speech. The only place it was covered was in the New York Times. And I asked several reporters what happened, and they said people don't want to hear about that. Uh, thirdly, the Eagleton affair, uh, I think, damaged us very greatly. I do not myself think that we would have won without it, but I think we would have won 10 <coughs> states or so. And then I think George McGovern would have been viable far into the future as a presidential candidate. I have two vivid memories of election night. The first is personal. It's John Holm and Sandy Berger and I sitting on the floor in the room with Senator McGovern, and he looked down and smiled at us and said, 
there they are, the men who wrote the words that moved the nation. Uh, uh, if, if, in, his, in his concession speech, he quoted Adlai Stevenson quoting Lincoln. And looking back over 25 years, and I find it hard to believe it's 25 years, I'd paraphrase that quote. Uh, if you look back at that campaign 25 years later, it still hurts too much to laugh, but it was way too glorious and too authentic to ever cry. We wanted to have Bob go first because he may be having to take off in a, in a few minutes. That's why we're trying to get him to the beginning of it. Uh, He's wondering if speaking of Hubert, Hubert Humphrey rally somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well uh, let the, our next speaker is Dr. Hunter S. Thompson, who I think you all are familiar with. Uh, a political journalist, fiction writer, and also wrote, of course, The Campaign Trail, 1972. He has a new book coming out now called The Proud Highway, which is a collection of his letters, which will be out in June. And I think Gen um, Senator McGovern's called the book Campaign Trail 72, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail, the best book that emerged out of that, um, out of that campaign. So, Hunter? Oh, hi. Well, let's see. Thank you, George, for that. This fucking thing is not coming toward me. Is that right? Are we on? All right. Hi. I'm not sure what to say. Uh, you're talking about Sioux Falls, South Dakota, is that right? That night? Election night? Yes. That remains one of the truly heinous nights of my life. And in memory, it, uh, it's like a deep, you know, one of those scars that heals, but it has nerve endings loosen it and you know itches all the time or when you bang it on something or when it rains yeah it was a uh, a nasty night but the uh i'm not gonna speak here i'm i'm, I'm just gonna uh you know say hello we can talk to people i was not prepared for a speech like bob's actually i want to hear megawitz try to explain why this happened and why that everything has been criticized in these uh moments of uh other people speaking why it all traces back, Frank, to you? <laughs> why, my, why, my life, somehow, I don't blame George. He's a decent man. But, ye gods, I mean, uh, we have to look at the root of uh, maybe perhaps one of the, you know, the most decent, elegant, maybe foolish campaigns ever. And they've been taken over by a dark op like Frank here. <laughs> that was another one of my uh, major experiences in that campaign, just dealing with Mankiewicz. Uh, I didn't know he, Lee Atwater well, but uh, I understood but the principles that made him move. And let me tell you that Frank is, Frank is darker than almost anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> no, I'll come back, Frank. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my moments here for a second so you can, in decency, let's... This is my good friend, Frank Mankiewicz. Frank, do you want to jump in on this? Come on in, Frank. <laughs> I just, uh, here. Every once in a while, Hunter, come, Hunter, I guess he hasn't for a while, but he used to come to Washington fairly regularly and stay with us. Frank. Frank. I used to know when Hunter was due to come to Washington because I would start to get his mail. Uh, <laughs> he would have it forwarded, which was a sure sign that soon he would be on our doorstep. Uh, but he hasn't done it lately. I'm, I'm not sure why. Uh, I, I don't know what uh, Senator McGovern said about uh, Hunter's book, Fear and Loathing on the camp tra Campaign Trail, but I have been quoted many times, and I'll say it again. It was the most accurate and least factual account of that campaign. <laughs> <laughs> that covers a lot. Yeah. You want to think about that. Uh, just a, a, a few brief uh, uh, comments here. I think uh, there's a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to... to maybe uh, think less of the rules, the new rules and the government commission and the, all the rest of it. I don't think it had that much of an impact. Uh, I think George McGovern would have won the nomination under any set of rules uh, because he had the issue. No question that the uh, overwhelming majority of uh, voters in, what was it, 21 Democratic primaries uh, 
uh, felt as strongly about uh, the Vietnam War as he did. Uh, and I believe we'd have won, uh, as it was, he won 11 primaries. I think he probably would have won that many, maybe a few more. Uh, so I just, I, I, I don't think the rules change has uh, had that much impact, and I don't think it's rather widely known that George McGovern didn't even favor all the rules changes. Uh, I think if you go back and look and listen to some of the things he was saying, he probably thought the commission maybe went a little too far in some areas. I think George would have liked to protect winner-take-all, at least in California, at least in 1972, uh, and maybe a few other uh, uh, less drastic uh, changes, but I, as I say, I don't think it mattered. Uh, I've read something of what Mr. Is it Radish mm -hmm. had to say. I don't understand why anybody spends any time on him at all. Uh, here's a guy, along with others, along with others in in the in the mid 90s, early 90s, who decided the Democratic Party was finished uh, and wrote a book about it, only to discover. Uh, that we've now won two presidential elections in a row and probably are set to win a third and maybe take back the Congress again. And are certainly, it's far from a, a party that is, what's the word, that has had its demise. Um, people read, right, the, New York, the, they read the New York Times enough and they read about all the angry white males and decided the Democratic Party was indeed finished and then found out they were wrong. So I think we can... Uh, we can uh, do without uh, any further uh, serious consideration of those guys. And Radish, of course, only exemplifies a, a large number. I want to talk about one thing in the campaign that Bob Schrum uh, talked about, which was the, the emergence of, I think, an entirely different view of campaigning and politics uh, in the American media. Uh, it was, as it turns out, the hinge uh, between print coverage and television coverage. Uh, by 1976, you had a purely television campaign. 1968, I think it had been largely print. 1972, you also found, however, an extraordinary uh, overtaking of campaign coverage by what has been called, I think accurately, the, the Teddy White syndrome. Uh, Teddy was a marvelous political reporter who wrote a book in 1960 called The Making of the President, 1960, and then wrote one each four years after that. And he really did revolutionize political coverage because he stayed with the campaigns and he wrote about things that nobody had written about before. Yeah, money, uh, how campaign contributions were developed, uh, endorsements, how you got sheriffs to support the campaign, what it meant in West Virginia to have certain people for you and against you, how uh, um, uh, campaigns were conducted, polling, fundraising, uh, all the rest of the speech writing, all the, the uh, uh, techniques of campaigning, and very little on the substance which he wasn't trying to get at. But he was talking about how campaigns were conducted and how eventually they were won and lost. And that book had a profound influence on everybody, I think almost everyone, who wrote uh, about politics for a living. And I think the American press, the political press, ever since, have tried very hard without thinking about it to write that book every day. Uh, and those are the issues that you hear about. Those are the issues that are endlessly chewed over. I remember one uh, memorable day in, uh, in Illinois Senator McGovern, I think, uh, I think it was Sandy Berger, maybe it was Bob Schrum, but in any event, they had uncovered another terrible scandal in the Nixon administration, which was that, to put it fairly uh, uh, bluntly, the administration sold out the wheat farmers in order to get the Soviet Union to shut up when we bombed the harbor in Haiphong. That's about what it came down to. And the result was that there was this terrible grain scandal the, uh, the administration had uh, downplayed the amount of grain that the Soviet Union was going to want. And finally, when they wanted a great deal, the price was low. They made a, a, a disadvantageous deal for the wheat farmers. The Assistant Secretary of Agriculture wound up with a new apartment in New York and a job with one of the big grain companies. It was a hell of a speech. And he gave the speech in uh, his first stop in uh, downstate Illinois in wheat country. And I remember going over with the reporters the key phrases in the speech to be sure they caught it all and got all the uh, basic charges. And when the speech was over, Senator McGovern entertained uh, 
the press that was traveling with us and some of the ones who had come over for the speech. And the first question and the second question and the third question and the fourth question all concerned this key Teddy White issue. Here you are in Illinois for your first visit in the campaign. How come Mayor Daley wasn't here to greet you? <laughs> Legitimate question to be sure, but hardly the most important one that day at that time for that speech. And I think that's that became fairly typical of the coverage <clears throat> in 1972, and it has been fairly typical of the coverage ever since. Are you criticizing me, Frank? Uh, only indirectly. <laughs> <laughs> We've, I'd like to get Morris Dees in on this. Uh, Morris is one of the sponsors of Southern Poverty Law of this symposium, which we're grateful for. And uh, Morris was um, involved with fundraising in the 72 campaign. I thought he might want to say a few words about that. Thank you, Doug. Well, I was, I was rather glad to get the call in 1971 from Senator McGovern to come to Washington to help him get a letter out announcing his campaign. I was glad because having sued George Wallace to integrate the all-white state troopers in 1970, I'd rather limited my political career in my home state. <laughs> but when I, was, when I was driving to the airport to take the flight to Washington, I was listening. We have another conservative state in Central Government, apparently wasn't held in too high regard, considered unpatriotic, and I was listening to Merle Haggard's song, Okie from Muskogee, yes, and I never will forget the line, when you're putting down my car, my country horse, you're walking on the fighting side of me. So I arrived in Washington with some trepidation. But I was met by Henry Kimmelman, who I wish was here today, and Miles Rubin and Stan Kaplan and others who helped me work on the fundraising that made this campaign possible. Judge McGovern certainly was supported by millions of individuals in this country. And in direct mail, it only took getting the letters to the right people. With the help of Tom Collins, who's a brilliant copywriter, we wrote a letter announcing his campaign in 1972. Senator McGovern, I think, through some of his aides, had written a little one-page letter, and I said, Senator, you know, we've got to tell the whole story. And he allowed me to read all of his speeches, and we wrote a seven-page letter to mail out. Now, he didn't like the seven-page letter because some of his educated friends uh, at Harvard said it wasn't going to work. He'd be the laughing stock. So we mailed the seven-page letter anyway without him knowing it. <laughs> And I never really forget a touching incident in that campaign, because uh, I'd been in the direct mail business all my life, and I knew that long letters out pull little short letters. So uh, Pat Donovan, who's sitting here today, called me on the phone and said, come to Washington, the Senator won't speak to you. Well, some of those letters had come back to the Senate office. We used the Senate letterhead, and uh, today you can't do that. But we did then, and those letters had come back to return bad addresses, and Senator McGovern apparently had seen one of them. And so he, I said, well, I can't come. I'm trying a case back home. I'll come soon. I wanted some results to hopefully come in. Well, Senator McGovern called me, and he may not remember this, but I remember it well. He called me and uh, said, Morris. He said, and he began to read a letter he had gotten from a woman who had received and sent to him a $10,000 check, and that's what the federal government paid somebody who lost their son in Vietnam. And she had sent that check in an envelope to Senator McGovern and said that, that he, she wanted him to have that check instead of her. She didn't want that blood money. And from then, it's always history since. We collected $24 million from some 600,000 people. And I think that was just a token, though. That was a token of the grassroots support. And it wasn't just from young people. We got letters from people sending their Social Security check saying that they had been around long enough to know that President Nixon and others was wrong and Senator McGovern was right. I want to thank Senator McGovern here today also when that campaign was over for letting the Southern Poverty Law Center have full access to those 600,000 people. And he wrote the first letter out asking them to support our organization. And today we have 350,000 supporters. Senator McGovern is one of our biggest ones. Thank you. You know, it was, it was very interesting this morning uh, when that one of the speakers pulled out a check which he had sent to Senator McGovern for $5. Because most of those checks that Morris is talking about were in very small denominations. $10, $20, $30. Dear Senator McGovern, I don't have much money, but I want to stop the war. Uh, the little bank that we did business with across the street from the K Street headquarters, which in itself was an adventure, uh, was getting around 
5,000, 10,000 checks a day. And the, the manager of the bank came across the street to see Gary Hart and, and me and said, these are essentially uncollected funds. Somebody is going to have to sign for these uncollected funds who can stand good for them because we don't know whether they're good or not. And you keep asking me for the money because you want to buy television time that day or radio time. Long story short, I signed for them. And out of $24 million and out of tens of thousands of checks, there were $7,000 worth of bad checks, there are that, which is the smallest percentage anybody ever heard of anywhere. And there was a kind of innocence with that political contributions to the McGovern campaign. And what George McGovern deserves great credit for, since he is the last presidential candidate to do this, was to spawn a group of people who refused to be cynics. Some of them are old like me, and some of them are younger, and a lot of them are in the Clinton administration. But Bob, is that smart or not? Uh, Pardon? Is that smart? Oh, excuse me, Ben. Is it, have we learned something from, from Well, that? I think I think it's important to believe in what you're for. And I detest the fact that there are so many young people today who are constantly telling me in Charlotte, North Carolina, that politics doesn't matter, when in fact it matters to everybody. And it's because the nature of the candidates and the compromise with television and the compromise with principle, because otherwise you can't get the $400,000 contribution from the Liggett Myers Tobacco Company. And that bothers the hell out of me, because all I give a damn about are my three grandchildren. And I want them to have the better world that I thought we were working for, that I worked for in many campaigns with Frank in Kennedy campaigns and in the McGovern campaign. And I regret none of it. I am grateful for all of it. The hell with the Nixons of the world. For now and forever. In or out of the grave, and I'm not sure he won't come back. I think, why don't we open it up to the audience a little bit and you could direct your questions to the group or an individual. Anybody want to start off? Come on, speak up, somebody out there. Yes, sir. Pass me some nuts. Yes. yes. Um, I'd like to... Uh, address this to Mr. Mankiewicz. Uh, we heard what Mike Pareko uh, said when he called you. Uh, he quoted you as, as saying that you would not have, that the, uh, the candidate, uh, Senator McGovern, would never have said to the lady on the uh, Ozark Airlines plane uh, what he said. Um, I'm wondering if you might comment on the Ann Arbor, Michigan incident. Ann Arbor, huh? I Oh, all right. Well, uh, that was a very simple matter. Uh, Senator McGovern getting a lot of heat those days. Uh, I think it was in, it was the site of the Jackson State Prison in, uh, in Michigan. And uh, he was working the fence. And when he finished, some reporter who had been following him for the pool, I guess, came to me and said, well, you know, some kid was giving Senator McGovern a hard time. And the senator said to him, Listen, buddy, you can kiss my ass. And the story began to get around <laughs> uh, as being in the pool report. And as I recall, I uh, indicated, and I thought wisely, that it was unlikely that since Senator Kennedy was the Democratic nominee, that he would have said, kiss my elephant. And it did. <laughs> <laughs> it did deflect the incident a little bit. But, uh, but to me, uh, to me, it made uh, Senator McGovern seem all the all the better a candidate. And I notice you've got a KMA button on your lapel left over from that moment. Uh, I think on balance, we probably benefited from it. Other questions? Is it shameful that Frank yes. is denying his responsibility for the campaign? Yes. Uh, Mr. Thompson, in Fear and Loathing 72, uh, your rhetoric was actually much harsher against Hubert Humphrey than against Nixon. 